The following is brought to you by the Social Suplex Podcast Network. This is John Silver, lead recruiter of The Dark Order, and you are listening to All Things Elite. the 117th episode of Social Suplex's podcast about AEW with the proclivity for positivity. Welcome to All Things Elite. My name is Austin Somewhat. I am the host of this lovely show. Joining with me, as always, is my good buddy and friend, Floyd Johnson Jr. My man, how you doing? I usually start off with like this long thing, but we got like two shows to cover now. So we got to get a little faster. So I'm just going to say I'm doing good. Uh, the whole process for VIP tickets to AEW Fan Fest sucked. I'll get more into that <laughs> later. And yeah, that's all I got to say to get started. All right. And of course, we are once again joined by our third man. We have AEW expert and our good friend, Jesus J.R. Perez. Make sure you catch him out on his horror podcast, the Trick or Treaters podcast. He's joining with us once again. JR, my man, how you doing? I am hanging in there after my uh, ordeal in the urgent care the emergency room yesterday at a local hospital. Um, I will say this, and I really don't give a shit if people give me heat. I cannot stress enough after yesterday's experience at emergency room the importance of vaccination because of how many unvaccinated cases are overrunning hospitals and i when i say this firsthand i dealt with this firsthand yesterday and last week my uncle at a different local uh emergency room dealt with it um as well where you come in and literally you just you're waiting and waiting and waiting to be seen in a lot longer periods than I've experienced for emergency rooms because their number one priority is intubated COVID patients and people who have like heart attacks and stroke like conditions. If you're not in that category, you're not a priority in their list. And I was there for approximately over six hours and I actually felt fortunate because there were people there that were longer than me. I have no idea how I was able to get out in just six hours. Um, but yes, it is, I cannot stress it enough. And so I, fortunately I'm, you know, in a better health and I got checked out and everything's fine. I had my whole illness had nothing to do with COVID, but, um, yeah, it was, it's not good. And, uh, so, uh, I made it out and I'm doing better, especially after today's show. Yeah. Um, I'm all there with you, man. JR, we're very happy that you're feeling better. But yes, we're we all here at All Things Elite want to make sure we continue to say, guys, please get vaccinated. It's the only way we're gonna get out of this. So please do your part. We really appreciate it. If you do, do it for your friends here at a- All Things Elite. Really, if you do it for anybody else, like your friends and family, whoever, if you don't listen to anybody else, like if you listen to us and you get vaccinated because of us, like you don't even got to tell us just the fact that that happens. If you guys get vaccinated, it just means the world to us. So please and, and do your part. I'll say this too, like real quickly. Cause I know like there's a lot of, well, you know, if I already had, you know, people who, who are vaccinated get COVID and that's true, but I'm going to tell you the difference. That's all firsthand. I, I actually was in the vicinity as a, somebody who actually was a vaccinated person who contracted COVID. He was an older gentleman. And the doctor checked him out. And yeah, and he was sick. I'm not saying he wasn't. He, you know, he had a fever and he had, you know, he was telling me that he had like body aches. 
But the difference was that this gentleman who had gotten COVID, he was stable. The doctor told him, you are fine. You are good to go home and rest. And we're going to give you medication to help you. But you don't, you, because of your vaccine, don't have to be in that hospital with the intubate, intubated with the tube down your throat. Yeah, or the ventilator, and, yeah. And by somebody who, uh, you know, I have um, doctors in my family, as somebody, if you are vaccinated, you're less likely to get COVID. Not that it won't prevent you from getting COVID, but you're less likely. If you're less likely to get COVID, that means you're less likely to spread to COVID that somebody could get it and end up in the hospital as well. And when you're in that position where you need emergency help, or your child needs emergency help, or your parent needs emergency help, and they can't get it and when they need it because of those resources are not there, it's a different story. I'm telling you, seeing it firsthand, it's a, you know, I heard the stories, but seeing it firsthand, it was somewhat traumatizing. And shout out to the nurses and doctors who go through that day in and day out because I cannot explain to you like what they were doing as warriors in that field. Yeah, we really don't deserve our first responders. They are truly holding it down, and they are incredible. So all our loves to them, and we hope we're doing okay. But we're going to lift up our spirits a little bit more and talk AEW. We're going to talk some wrestling. Um, we got a lot to talk about, of course. We are recording this only 15 minutes after the first episode of AEW Rampage has gone off the air, and what a night it was. And, of course, we've still got AEW Dynamite Homecoming that we will be talking about. But before we get into... The show, and actually it wasn't uh, AEW Homecoming. The notes were wrong. It was in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So, Floyd, your notes are wrong. <laughs> and I just read what was on the notes. I did my full. I deleted it. So it was, yeah, I deleted it's it. It's all good. <laughs> AEW Dynamite took place in Pittsburgh, not Homecoming. That was last week. Britt Baker's Baker Baker Homecoming. Yes, Britt Baker's Homecoming is as you way. Um, in Pittsburgh, we got to talk about Dynamite and Rampage today. We're going to be covering all of that. But before we get into the show, we got a spiel. Make sure you guys download this fine show on Google or Apple Podcasts. If you listen to us on Spotify or any other podcasting platform, give us a share with your friends, family, coworkers, whoever you wish really would mean the world to us. If you do that, you can leave a rating and a review. And if you're so inclined, you can also leave a donation through our podcast provider, Red Circle. Easiest way to support us as well is to support us on social media. On Twitter, we are at AT Elite Pod. At Social Suplex are the guys that make this show possible, and they have a bunch of other podcasts on their network. Check those out. I am at Austin Sumowitz on Twitter. That's S-Z-U-M-O-W-I-C-Z. Floyd is at Floyd Johnson Jr. on Twitter. And JR, where can people find you and the Trick or Treaters podcast on social media? So uh, today, happy Friday 13th to all my uh, spooky ghouls and and, uh, witches out there. So you can find us at Trick or Treat Pod. That is at Trick or Treat Pod. We just dropped today's episode on, um, it wasn't about Friday 13, but it was on Friday 13, about Hashtag Alive. It was a South Korean uh, zombie flick uh, on Netflix. Um, they have the, inter- the distribution rights in America. I cannot stress enough how, if you're into zombie flicks, it is in Korean. They have subtitles and all that good stuff on, and I think they have uh, English dubbed as well. Amazing flick if you're into zombies. Um, and we had a special guest this week who was all about this movie. I thought it was one of our best episodes we have, have a special with spe- a special guest. Next week on the um the 20th, we will be dropping our third Netflix original uh for the babysitter. I excited about that it was one of my favorite uh movies that Netflix dropped. So and then you can find me at Kukui Professor. Kukui is basically Spanish for the boogeyman that all of us Mexicans grew up fearing. So that's at Kukui Professor. All right. Well, first off, of course, the big news of the week is that AEW Rampage made its debut on TNT. It happened just over an hour ago, 10 p.m. on TNT Eastern Time. And, yeah, I mean, of course, we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of Rampage, but just the fact that AEW has become so successful that we have a second show ready and ready to go on TNT and very shortly into next year, TBS will be the home of AEW Dynamite, which is very exciting. But also, I think this is a good point where Floyd can explain exactly uh, how he went with uh, the AEW Fan Fest tickets. I know that's one of our headlines that we were going to throw at the end of the show. But I want kind of right now, since we all know Rampage happened and we're going to talk about it later in the show. Let's, Floyd, let let people know how the uh, Fan fan Fest tickets went for uh, All Out. All right. So, first of all, they used Eventbrite. And then I knew it was going to be a cluster at that point. I love Eventbrite. I've used Eventbrite for so many different 
contest in the I mean uh different sites. All the star casts were event bright, and that was great. But the thing is, they don't have a lot of security measures at all, really. So bots, whatever, fake accounts, blah blah blah, all those things that other sites protect against, they don't really have it. So the tickets sold the okay. The regular tickets you can still go get. You can still go get GA for the uh, third or the fourth because they're doing it on Friday and Saturday. It was originally announced uh, Thursday and Saturday, but they're doing it on Friday and Saturday. So the GA you can still get, but the VIP tickets, which is the hot tickets, is what everybody wants. So I was trying to get VIP tickets. I tried to click. Sold out immediately. Immediately. Like, my, I had my timer up I to the point where it went green and they were sold out within seconds. So, yeah, that's kind of disappointing. Yeah, I apologize, I, I, man. And first, and another thing, there was confusion on if you had to buy GA to use the VIP and it's, it was... They were. Cl- I don't understand why it's confusion. The only reason it's not it is confusion is because people don't read. I actually even put the exact information that they would see on the All Things Elite account and sent it out so everyone could see. And it clearly says, to do VIP, you must also have a general admission ticket. So, I do have some good news. Something the professor doesn't even know. No one knows. So I was sitting there and I got RGA and I was like, you know, and the professor knows me. I'm going to keep refreshing. Right. I told you, I told you that. Right. Mm -hmm. 26 minutes after the tickets went on sale on the Friday one, I got one VIP ticket for Friday. Damn. So somebody's payment option did not go through. All right. Yeah. So one, yeah, I got one. Cause I, I was like, and I always tell people, and I will keep telling my friends, even when you think it's done, keep trying for about 20 minutes after. I know it's annoying, but payment options don't go through. I got yeah, I, mean, I, I got second row. It got the, the combo pack second row for all out weekend, like 30 minutes after the tickets went on sale. Yeah, we got our all out tickets probably like I want to say 20, 25 minutes after they went on sale. Uh, it just because some some just somehow came available and we were able to snag them. Yeah, it's payments not going through. It's like yeah, people you know people trying to do their payment and they're either not enough money on the card or not type or of card or, because it's like uh, yeah, it's too much money. Payment. Yeah, because what I do when I get on when I do I make sure my payment stuff is saved. If it's going, if I have a feeling it's going to be a lot, and I did this this morning, I call my bank and I get my daily and limit raised before every time, just in case. Because today my plan was to spend about a thousand dollars on tickets and I didn't, but I called them to let them know, hey, don't block me if I try to do this. And they literally put a 25 or four hour release to where, you know, anything you put through up to, I think it was up to two grand will go through. So it's just, you have to be prepared for these ticket things. It's just, it gets annoying when you get the tickets you want and then lose out on from any other reason. Mm-hmm. But the VIP is really good. Like on the first day, Friday VIP, you get two meet and greets. And then one, there's, it's going to be one VIP exclusive signing. So I imagine that's going to be a big name like Kenny Omega or Chris Jericho or something like that. Um, Then on the Saturday one, which was even better, it was a little more expensive, but you get four meet and greets plus the VIP exclusive. So you get five, you know, you got five autographs for the VIP without getting the bag, the tote, you know, the tote, the shirt, the first access to uh, all the events and stuff. Without any of that, the two fifty is worth it for the five. You're going to spend more of that, more than that, on the photos and photo ops and stuff for it. But it's a they do a good price. AEW gives a great value, but why didn't they just use Ticketmaster like they always yeah. did? 
<laughs> it's, well. it's, it was it, it was frustrating. I, I I am a very nice, calm, loving person until I don't get what I want. Then I turn into an annoying little bitch. There you go. Now, I'm just going to be real. Like, if I got tickets today, I'm like, Eventbrite was perfect. That was the way to go. I didn't get what I wanted, so it sucks. There you eh. go. <laughs> I'm just saying. At least you're honest about it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I'm gonna be straight with you. And like, if I got the tickets, you wouldn't hear me complain it at all. <laughs> I'd be like, "Woo, that was the smoothest transaction ever in my life." <laughs> but no, that's not how it worked. So I was not happy. Well, well, did I surprise you, Jr? I didn't tell you. I tell you everything. Was that a shocker? <laughs> No, I'm not shocked because if anybody could have done it, it would, it would have been you. I just kept refreshing. I kept refreshing. And then when it came up, it said, it like, literally only gave it the option for one. So, it, it, it I, one of those guys, man, like, he will get tickets no matter how much shit you throw in his way. Like, this man will get floor seats or, like, just ringside or just get tickets to an event that should be sold out, but they uh, somehow still have tickets. He gets tickets no matter what. I, I got to say, it's a lot. For my peeps, all my friends always have my back. They know, you know, I know, and a lot of it's luck. But I'll tell you, on those events, it's honestly because people tap out before me. Mm-hmm. I was, I was probably the only one still twenty minutes in, refreshing. You know, people were like, "No, I'm out." You know, I didn't get tickets. It said sold out. Why is he still refreshing? It said sold out. No, no. <laughs> Another ticket can come out. Another ticket can come out. Never give up. That's never how- give. I, I, that's what happened on my P- PS5. I think I told the story on this show. It was Walmart went on sale at eight o'clock in the morning. By eight o three was sold out. I got mine at eight twenty one because I just kept refreshing, and somebody <laughs> didn't. Some purchase didn't go through, and there was one left. So I and yeah. I, that is my ticket hint to you. Just because it's you initially, you know, keep going, keep going. Never give up. Never give well, up, John Cena. Now, uh, I do want to throw a shout out because the term AEW sexual has been going around, and I hate oh, it. Oh, yeah, that's a thing. I hate it, but it's a thing. And to me, what to me, I don't know what it is per se, but it seems like somebody that, like, AEW can do anything they want, and then WWE can't do anything. You know, you're always going to say it sucks. So I do have to give a shout out to WWE tonight, Friday night. I watch SmackDown every week. Everyone knows I'm just a loyal wrestling watcher. Um, if you get a chance, if you don't want to watch the whole show, go to YouTube. I'm pretty sure they're going to have the whole segment. Magical segment between Roman Reigns and John Cena tonight. Oh, I'm, so talk- I'm talking like 90s Attitude Era, two masters of the mic. I have been seeing John Cena crush people on the mic for like, 15 years or whatever, however long he's been wrestling. He just crushes people on the mic when it's one-on-one. I got to say, tonight was a split decision, maybe a draw. It was, Roman Reigns was just as good, and he did it his way. He didn't try to match John Cena. He still kept his same cadence, that calm, relaxed nature, and apparently neither one of them are scripted. I'm not saying that's what WWE has to do, WWE has to do for everybody because I imagine some people probably suck not being unscripted, not being scripted, but good Lord, it was raw. I mean, if I wasn't already going to watch the pay-per-view like I already do, it made me feel like, oh, there's some real beef between them, and that's when wrestling's the best. When you start questioning, that's when wrestling's the best. Yeah, I mean, my my boy CM Punk got referenced in that promo by jo- John Cena, which I mean, like, I don't even know what to fucking say anymore. Like, his my boy's name is just being slung all around by guys like Darby Allen and John Cena, and I'm just like in both companies, and it's like seven years, almost eight years since he left, and now he's supposedly showing up next week at Rampage, and I'm going to be there. Like, I. I'm going to calm down because if I don't, I'm going to go on a tirade and I'm going to freak out and I'm going to be spazzing like a fanboy. So. The, 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 the crazy thing is there's more excitement around professional wrestling in general. Truly. Then I can then I can last remember. I probably AEW launching, but wrestling yeah, is hot. Yeah, we're all in there, yeah. Yeah, wrestling is hot right now and it's just 
and support it all. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, I think Triple A Mania or whatever the show is called is tomorrow night, uh, and it's Kenny Omega versus uh, Andrade for the Triple A title. Uh, also tomorrow night is the N, uh, NJPW in Resurgence from LA. Uh, the show, uh, Keeping It Strong Style, will be in the building covering the show. So Jeremy Donovan and the young boy Josh Smith will be in Los Angeles for Resurgence. And again, AEW represented on that show, John Moxley, uh, John Moxley with a mystery partner wrestling against the Good Brothers. It's just. It's just an exciting time to be a wrestling fan. Support as much of it as you can tolerate and that you can afford. I don't want anybody going to broke or massive amounts of debt for wrestling, but it's just a really, really great time to be a wrestling fan. No question. But with that out of the way and all of that covered, uh, let's get to AEW Dynamite starting off first. Of course, this emanated from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, home of Britt Baker DMD, Dr. Britt Baker DMD. First off, very nice uh, tribute at the beginning of the show with the graphic towards uh, beautiful Bobby Eaton. Rest in peace to him, of course. Uh, that was a great gesture, of course. We had a small little segment with MJF talking about Wardlow, making sure he got the job done. And then we were off with the trios match to open up the show with the elite Kenny Omega, the AEW World Champion, and the AEW World Tag Team Champions, the Young Bucks, facing off against... Top Flight's Dante Martin and the Seidel brothers, Matt, Matt and Mike Seidel. And um, this match was hot out the gate. This is what you typically get with the Young Bucks and uh, starting off AEW, including Kenny Omega, of course, the Elite. Whenever they start off a show, it's it's hype out the gate. But I got to say, off top, Dante Martin, he's he's out here making a name for himself because we knew – Watching Dante go, because he's wrestled multiple times before on Dynamite in singles competition since his top flight partner has been out, I believe, with an injury so far uh, for a while. So he's been kind of holding it down himself. Dante really let it shine uh, on this ep- on this episode of Dynamite and in this match. Did such a good job. And, of course, all th- all six of these men can just fly around the ring like nobody's business. What we talk about all the time in AEW is how well they can just – start out the gate with dynamite with their opening matches and it just keeps the crowd hype it gets them going and it's a fun energetic way to start off the show and this was no exception but i i honest to god man dante martin really showed a lot and while i do hope uh his top flight partner uh comes back healthy uh dante could do solo stuff honestly i could see it and it's it's uh it's really great to see, though. This match was crazy good. The match ended up finishing uh, with uh, the uh, the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega getting the win, with Kenny Omega hitting the one-winged angel and getting the pin on Dante Martin after the uh, BTE trigger as well was used. And then Tony Schiavone got, got in the ring, started to interview the elite. Don Callis quickly got on mic, started going down and running down Pittsburgh. Christian Cage comes out. Don Callis calls him the Stanford Stooge, which, nice. Uh, Starts calling him out, being like, you're a little bit outnumbered. Jurassic Express, Jungle Boy, and Luchasaurus come down and flank him. And they even the odds. And then Christian, after getting told off by Don Callis, saying, your AEW title shot is going to be at All Out. And Kenny really can't wait to beat you up on September 5th. So you should go back on the bench and wait your turn. And he's not wrestling you in Pittsburgh. Christian then responds, calling him a jag off, and then said, I talked to Tony Khan, and Kenny Omega and Christian Cage will be facing each other at All Out for the AEW World title. However, you have more than one more championship, and I talked to Tony, and I will be wrestling you in Pittsburgh for the Impact Championship this Friday on Rampage. And Jungle Boy also said... uh, Next week on Dynamite, we will be going for your tag team titles, Young Bucks, Jurassic Express. So a lot got said right at the end of this match, um, which one of which of those things we saw tonight on Rampage. And one of those things we'll see next week on Dynamite. A lot just said right there out the gate, so I'll throw it to JR. Thoughts on this opening match and uh, the announcement of Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy taking on the Young Bucks next week for the AEW World Tag Titles? Man, I really enjoyed Dante Martin. Um, you know, I've, I 
kind of the term like flippy shit, circus Olay type stuff has been thrown around for like a lot of years, you know, especially when you look at um, like the matches Will Ospreay and Ricochet had in previous years in New Japan. But when I saw Dante Martin, one of the things that I, I saw was like, man, everything he did was extremely fluid and he looked so natural in his movements and as his progressions of certain high flying spots. And I wonder, as he's so young, and it's, this is one of the hard things, of, and Floyd says this all the time, is that today's generation is that patient. So that's true, because immediately people are going to be like, he needs to be champion. But he's so young, and he has he has his whole career ahead of him, um, but he's also on national television. So I wonder if he does go a single route, or if his partner comes back, um, you can definitely see him being a champion, but... I wonder what year that will come. Is that year three, year four, year five? But he's definitely somebody to keep an eye out because he, because what he does, what he did in the ring was extremely special on Wednesday. As far as extra stuff, um, I, I've always, I said this. Um, I wonder where we're going with all out because obviously we know Christian Cage versus Omega is going to be essentially the main event with their AEW Championship match, but with somebody like the Young Bucks. You know, I thought it was going to be Jurassic Express versus Young Bucks at All Out because they just because uh, that's what I thought they were going to say, but now we're getting it approximately two weeks before uh, before All Out, so it's like where are they going to move forward with the Young Bucks and the Tag Team Championship after that? So uh, that was my only question. The match with Christian Cage and Omega. The only thing I'll say about that is, for me, it's. It's kind of weird because you're booking Christian Cage versus Omega on free television for that we saw today, but then you're all up with it on pay per view. And I probably would have done different is to get people to pay to see them in the ring first, and then put the second match on free television. Well, I was excited. I thought this was. I mean, people. Um, and, you know, people on Twitter, the IWC, have, we basically have a whole generation of people. I've, and I've using this term, I'm stealing it from Joe Lanza, uh, from Voices of Wrestling. We have a whole generation of people who have only seen WWE booking. They've only experienced one type of booking. And because of that, people's like, you know, you're supposed to do it this way. You're supposed to do it this way. You're supposed to do it this way. The thing about Tony Khan and AEW is they have taken traditional booking and they do it. Don't get me wrong. They, they do traditional booking, but they've tweaked it to their style. If you would have asked me if it would be good to book two Christian Cage and Kenny Omega matches at the same time, I'd been like, I know, but... With Christian Cage, fans not really being that excited about Christian Cage uh, being uh, wrestling against Kenny Omega. It was very a lukewarm reaction to Christian Cage wrestling uh, against Kenny Omega uh, that you can use the first match to build the pay-per-view match. So, you know, I heard, like I said, this is a stolen idea, and it just opened my mind to the experience that... Yes, this is not what you've seen before, but it can still work because with AEW, most of their profits comes from their TV deal. So getting that demo number and that rating number almost is more important than the pay-per-view number. Yeah. And yeah, I would say too, like, yeah, the original idea of people seeing, uh, because again, Everyone was all in and ready to go with uh, Hangman and Page going for the AEW World Title against Kenny. The story was perfect. We all had it set in our minds. And then, of course, the plans had changed, supposedly because of the new signings. And now we we're getting Christian instead, which I admit it, I was still excited because I'm, I'm, I'm a mega supporter of Christian because I've loved his work in Impact as well as his work in WWE, of course. ENC was one of my favorite tag teams uh, when I first started looking at old school WWF. Attitude Era Wrestling. I love DNC. And yeah, I, the reaction originally was lukewarm, but I think, yeah, giving them a match and kind of really showing what these guys can do together and then being like, oh, by the way, 
your top championship will be defended as well. I think was a decent was a good idea, and I think after the episode of Rampage that just aired and the match itself happening, I think people are like, okay, we kind of see what you were doing. Um, some people might not, but we'll we'll get more into the nitty gritty on that uh, when we cover Rampage. We then had a video package uh, that talked about. TNT champion Miro and how he's facing Fuego at Rampage and if Fuego won he would get a contract I'm not going to touch that quickly because if I do Floyd will go off on a tangent I'm kind of holding him at bay we're going to get to it but let's get to Darby Allen versus Red Death Daniel Garcia with 2.0 at ringside we're getting to see more of these three on Dynamite since they first showed up last week and this match between Darby and Daniel was really, really good. Dar- da- Gar- Daniel Garcia got a lot of good shining moments in this match. And, of course, Darby Allen is one of the most over wrestlers in AEW right now. He's so hot. He's so on fire going into uh, going into All Out. And just him being paired with Sting is so perfect as well. Uh, this was a strong follow-up to the opening match. A little bit more of... Uh, Contained singles wrestling with Daniel Garcia, really trying to focus uh, uh, focus on his arm and continuing to work on his left arm during the match, um, but still having a lot of high-flying offense that continued to keep the hype of what we just saw in the opening match. This was a really good follow-up. Of course, Darby Allen was able to still get the win, and after the match was over, however, after Daniel uh, he hit the coffin drop and got the win... 2.0 tried to get involved, and Sting started smacking him around, and it would lead into what would be announced for next week on Dynamite, where we're going to once again see Sting back in an AEW ring wrestling as they take on 2.0, which will be so much fun. But, JR, first off, thoughts on Darby versus Daniel Garcia? It's, um... Uh, guys like Daniel Garcia and, and the other previous uh, Wheeler Yuta has been on TV, they kind of remind me of WWE had a period of a talent that they weren't jobbers, but they also weren't like main, like big main roster guys. Um, this is when they were like kind of working sometimes with, like USWA or, or Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And so that's where you know they're going to give you a good match and to kind of further build up someone like the way Darby was being used um, as in this situation, first with Wheeler and now with Ryan Garcia, um, they're going to put on a good match. And you expect Darby to win, but he's also, he's not going to essentially be a squash. And that's what I like because you're continuing, Darby is a star. Um, there, it looks like he's going into a certain direction that they're waiting, they're biding time to to kind of like unveil that direction but he needs to be built up towards that direction and that's why a match like this is good for him all right floyd daniel garcia i have been impressed with at every turn uh he is a very technically sound he reminds me I'm not saying of these people, but I'm saying in their family there is a family of wrestlers that include uh uh, Gresham, uh, Jonathan Gresham, Daniel Bryan, Zach, uh, Zach Sabre Jr., that family of wrestler. Dan- Daniel Garcia fits in that family. You know, he's the young, a younger version of it. So very much a Mac, that Mac technician works, works on a limb, that kind of thing. I'm all for it. I'm all about it. So I'm really excited to see what he's going forward. Again, Darby is like, I, I'm running out of adjectives to describe what he brings to the company. I mean, when when first people say, oh, he's Sting, and I'm like, no, he's Jeff Hardy. But no, he's Sting. I mean, he might do like the crazy stuff like Jeff Hardy, but he that energy and the silence is very much the black and white crow sting from WCW. He's just so exciting and so explosive in every move he does. And like I said, I just can't put him over enough because and if people be like, "Why are you putting him over so much?" It's because I didn't believe in him. I was one of the guys at the beginning that was like, "Dude's too small. I'm not going to buy anything he does. I'm not going to buy him beating bigger people. I'm not going to buy this." He does nothing for me, blah, blah, blah. I was that guy. 
And I don't even like to admit that I'm wrong. Everyone knows that. But good Lord, I couldn't have been more wrong with Darby Allen. I mean, he's like he's he was like a seventh round pick. I mean, he's Tom Brady in points. You know, he's the sixth round pick on my book. And it was like, oh, he's he's the best. And it's just like he might not look what you need, but he is everything you need in a professional wrestler. Yeah, he's really shown a lot of shine, and this match itself uh, really proved that. And we're going to continue to see more of them and 2.0 down the line. I, I, I'm wondering how long it takes if they actually do end up getting signed. We'll see if that ends up happening. But even if not, uh, they are showing themselves a lot that they are they, they can be commodities for sure for those that want them. So I, 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 could, to- I could see them being Fuego for a while, where they're signed, but they're not signed. Yeah, where they're like not officially announced, but but they're on every show. It's like they're yeah, on every show. Through, it, it'll be three weeks in a row. Yeah, it'll be three weeks in a row that they'll be on, and that's definitely saying something. So I even mean, if they even if they don't get signed, they were on Dynamite three weeks in a row. You don't think Indies are going to be looking at that, and being like, we should get that? There is just so many wrestlers like that, uh, especially with the COVID time that were around for a very, very just around and just around forever and you you thought they were signed you like oh they're signed and a, a, a na- one name i'll use kylan king she was on every episode of dark like every episode she'd be on AEW dynamite losing i thought she was signed and they were like oh she's not signed i was actually shocked a person that covers the AEW and talks about it every week well, i was actually shocked she wasn't signed because She's always there. Yeah. Well, we'll end up seeing what happens with uh, 2.0 and and Daniel Garcia down the road. But we then had a short little backstage promo with Death Triangle, Ray Phoenix, Pack, and Penta were all together, and they were all making sure that everyone was on the same page that like Andrade Alito won't support this. Ray Phoenix. Uh, like they were all kind of being like, who's going to get there? Who's going to go after, uh, Andrade and Pac eventually was like, you know what? I'll handle it. You two focus on getting the tag team titles. And listen, we have no idea why you're obsessed with death triangle, but Andrade come and have a go. If you're, if you're, if you're ready for it, uh, I'm not hard to find. I'm easy to find. So Pac is throwing down the challenge as he will be the one going after Andrade. Wow. The Lucha Bros end up continuing to fight for AEW Tag Team titles. But after that, we had another trios match, actually. We had best friends Chuck Taylor and Orange Cassidy um, teaming with Will Wheeler Yuta, facing off against the Hardy family office, Matt Hardy and Private Party, the Hardy Party themselves, Isaiah Cassidy and Mark Quinn and Matt Hardy, while TH2 and Angelico... Jack Evans and Angelico, the Blade and the Bunny were ringside for this match, and we know that uh, we know that Trent is he had a surgery recently, which is why he was not uh, on television this week. So that is where he was. This was a pretty strong match too. Uh, Wheeler Yuta continues to be showing himself as well, kind of being Orange Cassidy's like young boy, I guess you could say, and being kind of the newest member of uh, Best Friends, which seems to be growing consistently. Uh, it's so weird to think of Best Friends as now kind of like a faction now with the inclusion of, of uh, oh my God, why am I blanking on her name? Chris Statlander, now that Chris Statlander's joined and Wheeler Yuta's joined, it seems like it's growing more and more by the day, which is just weird to say. I'm just so used to when Best Friends was just Trent and Chucky e. T. But regardless, uh, this was a really strong match. Uh, Yuta was able to uh, fight and try, but Matt Hardy then quickly was able to get the pin on Wheeler Yuta. This was a nice way of getting uh, the the Hardy family office a good strong win against an established group like Best Friends. Wheeler Yuta was able to be the one to take the fall. And considering how uh, the Hardy family office kind of hasn't shown, other than the Blade who has been consistently being used on uh, Dynamite, TH2 hasn't really done much. Um... Hardy himself lost to Christian because Christian's been unstoppable. They these guys needed a win, and while Best Friends has been unstoppable, they can they were in a position where they could take a loss. So it was good to see actually seeing the Hardy family office get a win for themselves. Uh, and yeah, I think other than the Bunny, who's gotten some good wins before, yeah, not a lot of them have gotten wins on Dynamite. So this was good to see, at least on my side, uh, from how I feel. 
But JR, thoughts on this trios match? Um, it, it was a solid match. I think it had gave everybody the opportunity to, to showcase themselves a little bit. Um, the one thing about the Hardy uh, family is that Matt Hardy being a veteran has a big name. So by doing what they do, they it, it kind of this. I'll say this in general for this whole episode of Dynamite is that. Everything was solid. It's one of those, these are one of the episodes you have, like you've seen a TV series where you can have banger after banger of an episode, but then you have one where it's not that there isn't a high point, but it's to further along t- to continue to the next episode. And that's why I kind of felt like with this match and the previous matches that we're kind of buying our time waiting to the next episode of Dynamite. So we got solid matches to move some people, like move chess pieces around a little bit. All right. Yeah, and, 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 yeah, and um, Willa Yuta be, uh, becoming more and more of a fan. Uh, if people saw the news this week, he actually tried out for the WWE, and because of their new uh, take on signing larger people that are a little bit younger, they actually passed on him. And a lot of people were like, like shocked and upset because he's such a great talent, and it's kind of like yeah you know over here like yeah good job passing i know again i am fully aware that hey you can't sign everybody but when you have someone that comes in and they work and they seem to get into the gimmick of what they're doing and fit in so well trent wasn't a big talker you know so you would have just slid right in there i know he's kind of the young boy of the group but he did slide in to a very similar position all i gotta say is they need to get him a denim jacket he's breaking dress code so <laughs> they, they need to get him a denim, denim jacket and but he's really awesome and uh, you know i could see him sticking around for a while and you know because he's only 24 you know he can be in that mid to low card for a couple years before you uh, need to push them when some of the uh, other wrestlers start getting older. Uh, But solid match. I love what they're doing with Matt Hardy's character. Matt Hardy is, he doesn't really have the commentary chops, but his attitude and how he is as a person reminds me of like a Bobby the Brain Heenan of the 80s. Even in the move where he literally threw Mark Quinn <laughs> into the other guy and used him as a battering ram so he could uh, then hit his uh, twist uh, twist of fate. Like I say, he's still an active wrestler, so of course there's going to be differences, but just in the despicable heel thing, I haven't seen like such a the despicable carny heel in a very, very long time. Yeah, Hardy has really done well with this new persona since really uh, broken Matt Hardy uh, when he was uh, when he was in AEW. While he was entertaining to an extent, it felt like kind of like the character had kind of run its course. And especially considering how he he nearly got really hurt, uh, they kind of took him away for a little bit, kind of allowed him to reinvent himself and try some different things. And I've really liked what Hardy's done with himself uh, with this. Yeah, like you said, Carney heel that he's been. Um, but yeah, again, I will say these guys definitely could use a win, and getting a win really helped them a lot, I think. But we had a small backstage segment with Andrade and Chavo Guerrero responding to Death Triangle, basically saying, Pac is ungrateful, be careful what you wish for. Chavo going like, Andrade's the boss, you're going to find out who's the boss at All Out. So setting up Andrade versus Pac at all out which will be a hell of a match like such a good match i'm so excited for that and then after that we had chris statlander taking on the native beast nyla rose in between the match the trios match between best friends and the harley hardy family office chris statlander was at ringside but then nyla pounced on her and they started fighting a little bit uh in between the match it so as as this match started uh, Chris was feeling some wounds already, and Nyla, once again, before the bell even rang, pounced on her again, really trying to put quick work of her. Chris statlander has been very strong and very protected and very over for these last few months since she's come back from injury. Nyla continued to try and uh, uh, fight, but eventually uh, Chris Statlander was able to counter her, get the Area 51, and get the win. So despite Nyla trying to beat her down in areas and really try to 
set herself up for an easy win. Chris is still proving herself to be incredibly strong and resilient and winning this match. She's been unstoppable, and I feel like it's really going to set up to the point where, in fact, we we did see she is due in line to be going after Britt Baker for her AEW World Women's Championship. But real quick, since this match uh, was not too long, I would say, but it was uh, a decent length, I think. Uh, JR, thoughts on this women's match? Uh, I, when Chris Stallander went, when excuse me, when Chris Stallander won, the first thing that went to my head is like, oh, if she's getting position um, to go against Britt Baker at all out. I know a lot of people potentially thought it was going to be Thunder Rosa, but the way they kind of been building Chris up from her comeback, and then especially with this win, I was, and I know I kind of go back with Britt a little bit because they say like, oh, you know, I'm like, is she a heel or a face because her her match with Nyla was weird, but obviously she's, you know, after that match, she's kind of cemented herself as a heel, which means she needs a baby face. And with Chris winning this match, I'm, you know, I'm fairly confident that's what the direction they're going to be for all out. Bret Hart was a he- uh, Bret Hart was a heel in uh, American and face in Canada. That's what Britt Baker reminds me of right now. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. But uh, this women's match. Yeah, I just I would have liked it to be a couple more minutes. I think they could have told a little bit more story, but it was just Chris Statlander is just better than Nyla Rose, and that that works. It works. It did what it has to do. But you know, I think they could have got a few more minutes, and and, and that's just a small minor gripe because I'm watching it and it's like, oh, it's over already, and. I mean, Britt's a big part of the show. She's a big part of every show. So you can't say this no one's being featured. I mean, it's all about pushing Britt. It's all about getting Britt over. This was in Brittsburg, Pennsylvania. So, yeah, the spotlight was on her for this show. It really was. And speaking of Britt Baker, after uh, a funny little segment, I will say, of the Young Bucks continuing to run their mouths of being the best tag team in the world with continuing the basketball theme, uh, Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus then uh, steal the basketball from uh, uh, the Young Bucks at, that they were holding. Uh, well, actually, no, it wasn't a steal. Uh, Luchasaurus comes and blocks a layup from uh, the Young Bucks, saying that the win against them was going to be an easy layup. Luchasaurus blocks it. J- uh, Jungle Boy gets the rebound, and a vicious pick from Luchasaurus stuffs Matt, as uh, Luchasaurus goes in and puts the ball in the basket, and uh, yeah, very silly promo. I I appreciate some silly wrestling promos occasionally, and this was pretty damn silly, I will say. I I gotta say, it was a solid pick by Luchasaurus. Dude, that man was stiff as a freaking brick. (laughs) Yeah, I'm like, hey, hey, that's that's an NBA pick right there. Yeah, no selling on it. This man didn't need to flop or nothing. He just set the pick. And then boy fell down, and then he was just standing there. Like I was fully expecting him to do the Damian Lillard bye bye. I was fully expecting it, but wasn't to be. Regardless, we got to see Tony Schiavone introduce the AW Women's World Champion, Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, in her hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The terrible towels were flying very, very high, and I'm I'm just, I'm holding myself down trying to not make jokes about the Pittsburgh Pirates or the Steelers, but we'll get through this. We'll get through this. Uh, this was an incredible homecoming reaction for Britt. This is the reaction that we were expecting, and really leading into the Rampage match as well. This is what carried her and really set. Uh, not even really carried her, but this is what helped cement how important her women's championship reign is being right now. And it again really helped bounce back from the somewhat lackluster match she had against Nyla Rose for her first defense. This is exactly what she needed. So she talked about being the baddest bitch on the block, continuing uh, to uh, relate herself to the city of Pittsburgh, really showing um, how, you know, Pittsburgh hasn't been great recently with sports. Of course, the Pirates are a, a team, I guess you could say. The Steelers... Went 11 0 and then got eliminated in the divisional round. The Penguins got eliminated. And uh, yeah, it's just not been great for Pittsburgh. But regardless, they she showed them hope with that AEW Women's Championship. And Red Velvet comes down 
Boos fly wilding, and then she comes and jumps Britt Baker, and AW's had to, AWA officials had to separate the two. This was a really, really good promo. Britt worked the crowd so well. They were completely on her side. Red Velvet did a good job of like kind of jumping in there and realizing, like, well, I'm playing the heel because it's her hometown. And she did a really good job of sliding into that role, really showing herself to be like, like, like really confident. But in in this sense, being cocky. But this was a really, really well done segment. But Jr., we'll go to you first on this one. Her her hero promos just get better and better, and she has become one of the best individuals on the mic, in my estimation, for AEW. I mean. Again, I go back to when everybody kind of was like shitting on her when she cut that promo on the Jericho Cruise, you know, in January of 2020. I just, I, and the first thing I thought about was like, this is the right direction. Like, it, she's going to get over and be money. And look how she is now, some 18 months later. She, right, Floyd. She, she does a great job. I was actually talking, but I put him on some on mute. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, she's actually very good at staying a heel. She was saying really crappy things about Pittsburgh and how they needed a winner, <laughs> basically calling them losers. I mean, look, <laughs> she wasn't wrong. <laughs> I'm not saying she was wrong, but that's what heels do. They tell the truth. But I'm just like, people are like, I can't tell if she a face or a heel. Listen to her. It was a heel promo. She just didn't. She didn't do the run down the city like blatantly. Like, oh, Pittsburgh sucks. Of course, she's from Pittsburgh. She loves her city, so of course she's not gonna hate on it. But she took a lot of shots at Pittsburgh and the fans, and they just cheered her anyway because she's one of theirs. And you know how Pittsburgh is when you're one of theirs. And it's, uh, yeah, it was just great. She's so over. I, I. I I haven't seen a. I mean, this is Becky over to me. I mean, this is about as. That's what I. That's the only thing I can compare it to, is when Becky had her was doing the man thing at her height. That's where Britt to me is for AEW. I don't mean it on the same level as when you're over in WWE. I feel like there's two different levels, but Britt is that over for AEW. It is like she is the star. And then there's the rest of the roster. Yeah, it really kind of is like that, honestly. And I shouts out to her. She's really doing a great job of carrying the women's division on her back at this point. Really, she's done a great job. We then had the Impact World Tag Title match between the Good Brothers, Machine Gun Carl Anderson and Doc Gallows versus the Dark Orders, Eva Luno and Stu Grayson, the original tag team of the Dark Order with Boom Boom Colt Cabana. At ringside, who is the only member of the Dark Order to come and support uh, Evil Uno and Sue Grayson? Since they kind of talked about how, like, the Dark Order is kind of splitting with John Silver and the rest of the gang being like, no, what we sh- we're, we should be helping Hangman. Why are we not helping Hangman? And then Evil Uno and Stu are being like, he told us not to help him. He told us to stay away for a bit. We're staying away. It's, we're doing what he asked of us. We're not going to, like, go against his wishes. So. Dark Order kind of having a little bit of issues. I believe they mentioned some of that on uh, Being the Elite as well. I can't fully remember. I apologize. Regardless, though, Evil Uno and Stu Grayson did a great job in this match. Very few times that we've been able to actually see these two team uh, for tag titles worth. Uh, so seeing them go after the Impact World tag titles was great. I still stand by the Good Brothers as being so damn good. I know some people... Uh, I've heard a couple of people say that they aren't really a full fan of them. Um, Maybe they just remind them too much of how they uh, were in uh, WWE. Regardless of the fact, the Good Brothers are still incredibly good. This is a really strong tag title match, I feel like. And after the gun stun happened uh, from Anderson and then the Magic Killer came, that was the win, uh, getting Grayson and pinning him. Retaining the tag titles for Impact was the Good Brothers. Uh, Very good tag match. And uh, Boom Boom Cocabana, man, I just love seeing him at ringside get involved and just being able to back up uh, Evil Uno and Stu Grayson. I do, uh, I do. I love how he sold that. He punched Brandon Cutler and then sold yeah, oh, that Cutler his hand. Got, 
fucked up. Uh, he did the running punch and then sold that his hand got hurt because he literally hit him in his hard mass. So, yeah, I love it. It's just Cole Cabana is like one of those people. Like, he can make anything entertaining. For the life of me, I don't know how he didn't work in the WWE. Because crazy. he's so good at the comedy stuff. He's just so good at that. I'm like, I would love to see a segment between our truth and uh, uh, and Cole Cabana. It would just be the most hilarious thing ever. I don't even need them to wrestle. All right, we'll go to Jr. The thoughts on this Impact World Tag Title match? You know, it was this match that kind of led me to have this train of thought. And for the last number of Dynamites, and I mean, I think really, if you go back to the moment that the Young Bucks, you know, essentially turned heel and aligned with the Good Brothers and Kenny Omega, you kind of saw this this posse, and you were kind, of, and they've been dominated, and it to me was reminiscent of WCW Nitro when, in certain matters of all being the NWO, they were kind of dominant week after week after week. They were always winning matches, or they're always cheating to win, and like the good guy never got over whether. You know, the situation, Hangman and now in the Dark Order. And in my head, I, you know, I kind of took a different direction because some people are starring like, oh, it's getting bad or this is cheesy or it's corny or whatever. And I'm like, and I said, wait a minute. I, the way I'm seeing this set up, eventually somebody's going to get their comeuppance on these individuals. And when they finally do, it's going to be a big, massive, Babyface pop, and that's what I look at is that it may not be the dark order, but eventually they're gonna hit somebody that's going to put them in their place, and that's gonna be a big moment. Yeah, and I just want to actually talk about the match. Good brothers are, I can honestly say they're kind of like, um, I'm not a big fan, I'm a Pepsi guy, but you know, Coke always exists, right? And it's like, Coke is always gonna be the same no matter what. That's the Good Brothers. It's not changing. It's going to be the same. You either you either like it or you don't. You know, if you're not a Coke guy, you know you just you know you're going to drink Coke. It's like when I go to a place that only has Coke, I'll order water. If you don't like the Good Brothers, it's they're not changing. They've been the same since they were in New Japan. Same matches, same finisher, same style. I, I I'm a big I'm a bigger fan of Carl Anderson's in ring work than Gallows, but Gallows is a big dude, and he doesn't try to do anything else but be a big dude. So this match was very entertaining. I am a very big fan of how uh, Evil Uno and Stu worked, and I was like, you know, Impact to me, they have lost their momentum from the time that they had Kenny Omega on there, and I think they needed some uh, needed something to stimulate their product and i was like man having the dark order one of the largest baby face factions in AEW, crossing over to impact i thought would have been a shot in the arm and but you know it wasn't meant to be but i i thought the match was very entertaining it's like i'm never going to complain about the good brothers because they've been doing the same thing for like 10 years so it is what it is yeah really good point on that <laughs> we then had uh what was teased a couple weeks uh but we actually got uh qt marshall in the factory he was talking to tony and being like i will apologize to you and we never got it finally tony was like listen are we getting the apology so where's the apology qt's like you twisted my words you should be apologizing to me and qt marshall sent nick camarado to grab tony shivani's son christopher and like threatened to beat the crap out of him and they were swinging on him and uh tony was like screaming not to do it and eventually he apologized just said leave him alone qt goes apology apology not accepted hits a cutter on his son which god i mean like there's classic heel heat right there just being an asshole beating up somebody who everyone loves beating up their kid and making them apologize for doing nothing wrong and then eventually Paul White comes out. He AEW Dark Elevation counterpart to Tony Schiavone comes out. His co 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 anchor on uh, the commentary desk comes out 
and Aaron Solo gets pushed right into the fire by QT, and he choke slams the living hell out of him. Which, man, I gotta say, after uh, after Big Show being in WWE and kind of some of the dwelling responses that he got after being in WWE for so long and kind of being mishandled a lot. It's nice to see Paul White get some really good response. I mean, he did when he sh- showed up first at uh, AEW, of course, but just seeing him choke slam somebody and getting really good responses, man, that was that was a nice moment. It was a nice, fun segment to kind of like lead into the main event, kind of just to be a bit of a palate cleanser, but also just like nice little pop of a uh, QT getting on with the factory since they haven't really done a ton. Uh, and they got some good heel heat, but then Paul White comes out, sends them home, and then the crowd gets happy for that, I think. I think this was a nice little segment, though. But, JR, thoughts on this little segment here? You know, I've always been a big a big fan of Paul White um, because as a bigger kid growing up, I always enjoyed bigger guys. I wonder where, if this is one done or potentially to something. We haven't seen Paul White in, in a in the AEW ring, we know that he does commentary with Tony Schiavone for Elevation, but I think eventually that he may want to return to the ring at least for one time, at least wrestle one time in front of the AEW audience, and maybe it would lead to a opening match at AEW All Out in front of ten thousand plus people in the Now Arena. It could be a multi man match. It could be the Factory. Versus, let's say, Paul White and maybe Mark Henry. Or it could be maybe QT versus uh, Paul White. Yeah, Yeah. I popped for the moment. I don't know if it's going to go anywhere else. It probably is because AEW tends to not do one-offs. But I was just like the moment of, you know, the first time he really got physical in the match, Paul White. And it's... I just thought that was really cool. And I don't know what it's going to lead to. I don't know if it's going to lead to anything at All Out because everybody's been speculating on everything that's going to happen at All Out. I'm I'm one of them, and they're trying to guess. But, you know, most people are like, oh, I don't want that on All Out. But it's a three-hour show. Most of the time, closer to four hours. If somewhere in an hour and a half, two-hour part of the show – uh, you have Paul White out there against QT or in a handicap match or maybe in a tag match and he squashes somebody in five minutes. Is that really going to ruin the momentum of the show? It's probably, it's going to be like a palate cleanser to a lot of people to get to the next match and it's entertaining. And there are people, I know people don't like to think that because we live in this bubble where Paul White's not like really significant anymore, but there are people that will see this familiar face that's been on their TV for the last 20 some odd years and be like, maybe I should check this pay-per-view out. See what the big seeing Paul White, the giant wrestle on TNT for the first time in over 20 years. Yeah. And it's like, you haven't seen him in the, uh, and and it's like, Oh, maybe I'll check this out. And it's just like, people like stuff that makes them familiar, especially in wrestling, especially like even now I, everybody like, I, I hear you into wrestling. When Stone Cold coming back. I still get this in 2021. This dude has wrestled in over 10 years. And people still ask me when Stone Cold's coming back. So it's like, to think, most people will be like, I don't think anyone we cared in Paul White. Maybe in our wrestling bubble, it doesn't excite people. But people outside the wrestling bubble are very excited about Paul White. Yeah. I'm and just honestly, say, um, oh, go ahead. I was, the only thing I was say is that Paul White, while he is older... He is currently only four years older than a current world heavyweight champion. Uh, Paul White is at the age of 49. Probably in the best shape that he's since he's been in professional wrestling. Um, he has, if you follow, I've followed Paul White for a while. And some time ago, obviously, he, he deals with the same type of disease that Andre Giant dealt with. Um, the uh, the informal term is giantism. I can't remember the actual term it is, but it affects his weight. And so he's had numerous issues weight and he they kind of rededicated his life to fitness, to maintaining a healthier lifestyle so he can have a longer life than Andre the Giant did. And so he is, he, he's a big guy in really good shape. You know, the last time, you know, a lot of videos I've seen of him working out, photos I've seen of him. I think at one point he had almost, a, I think he had a six pack um you know he could go he can go rounds i mean and honestly 
there is wrestlers today that are younger than Paul White um, that are in a lot worse condition than that shouldn't be in the ring. And Paul White could still give you a good match, especially with the right talent, because he's he wrestles as a giant. And wrestling as a giant is a lot different than, let's say, like Matt Hardy, for example, that was wrestling a more high-flying style for a period of time, and it's hard for him to do certain things that he used to do. Yeah, I really, I really concur with everything you just said. Apologies if you guys hear a meow. Uh, my cat has broken into my room, and he is walking all over my keyboard right now. So if you guys hear a meow, that's why. Uh, but with that, with that out of the way, we can get into the main event of AEW Dynamite. The fourth labor of Jericho, the demo god Chris Jericho versus Wardlow with MJF at ringside. So we have to say... We thought we were kind of under the assumption that he would be the referee. He was not. He was just at ringside. And it was uh, very simple in this match. Uh, Chris Jericho, uh, he had to make sure that uh, in order to win the match, he had to... Uh, how, what was these? Okay, apologies. I, I just forgot the stipulation that he set forward for this match. Uh, the, was it just that MJF was going to be at ringside to make sure the match was called down the middle? Or Correct. Or was it just... Yeah, yeah, that, that was, was it. it. I thought there was something else extra. My apologies. Uh, this featured Wardlow again. I st- I'm, I'm really hoping Wardlow because I'm I'm wondering if we're just how close we're gonna get where Wardlow because uh, in our minds we're always like when is Wardlow gonna break off against Jer- uh, MJF and kind of become a free thinker and no longer work for MJF because they've kind of teased it every once in a while. Um, but it doesn't matter really what Wardlow does because he's still really freaking good. Like in a company that doesn't feature a ton of big men, he's one of those big guys that just does really great work. I'm I'm a hundred percent like it. Like out of all the big guys that they have in AEW, Wardlow is probably one of my top favorites, probably next to Luchasaurus, and he continues to showcase really great stuff whenever he gets in the ring. Uh, the F10 is just vicious, and, and Jericho sold it really, really well. Uh, there was a great little spot where Aubrey Edwards was dealing with MJF, and then Jews, Jericho was able to get that Floyd baseball bat, aptly named, and hit it over uh, Wardlow's face and then get the Judas effect real quick and get the win. Really great finish um, as MJF kind of cost it himself. It was sort of his fault trying to distract uh, as he tried to get the Dynamite Diamond Ring to Wardlow, but uh, MJF got ejected from that. Then, Sean Spears, after the match, comes and ambushes Jericho, starts beating him up. Sammy Guevara comes and stops him, leading into the fact that next week on Dynamite, we're going to get Sean Spears versus Sammy Guevara. Jake Hager then comes out and evens the odds after MJF gets in the ring and starts hitting the salt of the earth on uh, on uh, on, uh, Chris, on uh, Chris Jericho. And after everything gets uh, set, settled and squared away, Chris is told by MJF what the final uh, stipulation is for his match against MJF in the fifth and final labor. And it's simply no Judas effect. Finishers turned off only for you. Only I get finishers. You get no finishers. And no Judas music. So he's going to come out to complete dead silence which I can only just imagine how the crowd is going to just pull this out. and uh, Yeah, it's going to be the best it's moment It's going to be so, so great. I, I, I would be surprised. I would If I was in Jericho's position, if I that happened, I wouldn't be surprised if like he kind of tears up a little bit from it because it's just the images and the sound of the crowd is just going to be incredible. And, uh, of course, MJF finishes off. You hit the Judas effect, I automatically win. But also, forget about that because here's a prediction. You're not only going to meet your match next week, you're going to meet your successor, which was a really good line and a great closer for this episode of Dynamite. Match itself was really, really strong and really good. Wardlow threw Jericho around a ton, but Jericho used his smarts to be able to get the better on Wardlow. And we're going to get MJF versus Jericho in the fifth and final labor next week. So, JR, thoughts on this? Uh, closing match for AEW Dynamite. Um, you know, the, Wardlow has had three singles losses before this. Uh, he lost to Cody in his first match, AEW Steel Cage, lost to Hangman in the AEW semifinal tournament match uh, 
or to the number one contender. And then he lost to Hager in the MMA rules match, and now this one. And I and I think out of all of them, you know, all the losses have been strategic in the way they kind of position him. He lost, and you look at the people he lost to. Um, but I think this is the one where this loss protected him the most, where it's like he looked like a dominant monster, like he's going to like murder Jericho. And then because of MJF's interference, it essentially cost him the match because then Jericho was able to use the trusty Bat Floyd to, you know, take out Wardlow. And I like it for two reasons. One, it protected Wardlow. Um, and two, it kind of goes back to that possible tension as you saw in the earlier promo when, like, MJF said, well, you, you know, you let Cody beat you. That we bring that tension back of maybe Wardlow turns to MJF. And MJF, the most despicable heel in AEW, if Wardlow does do that, it's going to, I mean, the biggest baby face turn probably in, the, you know, in AEW short history that everybody would go bonkers for it to see Wardlow, tur- you know, just try to eat MJ, uh, MJF uh, alive. But I-, I liked everything about the match, the way it ended. Um, and MJF is so, I mean, for 25 years old, I, I want somebody to point to me a person that was 25 years old in their career and on national television that someone can say, like, that guy could be the world champion right now if they wanted to put it on him. He is so good because of everything, his ring work, his promos. And every time he cuts promos like this, it reminds me of that. I'm interested of in, you know, where they're moving forward for next week with the fifth labor. Um, so it's going to be amazing because I don't have to hear that terrible song next week. <laughs> awesome. I demand silence. I expect silence. None of these people in the crowd, I, I don't want to hear anything. I believe they're in Houston, Texas. So Houston, no talking. Just let him walk out in dead silence to be the miserable human being that he is. And then no Judas effect. This is an easy win for MJF. It's a layup. So, uh, yeah. Don't of, say that because then Jurassic Express will block that layup. <laughs> <laughs> match was great. Uh, I love the MJF after giving Wardlow shit about you better get the job this th- done this time. He was the one that actually cost him the ma- match. So it's like they have planted so many seeds from the day for the day when. Um, Wardlow eventually turns on MJF. That it's just like, and it, 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 I imagine there's subtle things like that. Like when they came out with that Pinnacle video, and you had seen how many times over the last year they had mentioned being the Pinnacle, and it was like, huh? So they've been setting these seeds these whole time. So yeah, that was awesome. So I feel like they're doing the same thing with Wardlow, and it's just like Wardlow's one of those people that when it's time, when you decide to let him go. When you break him off the MJF, you have to put the rocket pack on him. He he has to be your guy because oh, yeah. he can't be a, a dumb baby face. He has to be like when Batista left uh, Evolution. Uh, that's the best example I can have. Batista stayed in the back, stayed in the back when he would. But when he left Evolution, he was the guy. I think that has to be Wardlow's trajectory after he lose, leaves the pinnacle, or not even the pinnacle, he leaves MJF. Yeah, honestly, I am, I am totally on your side with that. And that was AEW Dynamite. Again, it was another show that felt like kind of had a few, like, it felt like a simple AEW Dynamite. Um, and I felt like they were really trying to save a lot of the big stuff for Rampage's debut, which we'll get into very shortly. Um, but this was a very solid episode of Dynamite. It had some really big moments, um, a lot of shining moments from some uh, some talent that we hadn't seen a ton of, but really took the opportunity and made the most of their time on Dynamite. Um, again, like it's 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 still exciting to see like there's a lot of talent that um, could be succeeding uh, even more so in Dynamite. And in AEW down the road, because AEW is continuing, I think, really to set the stage to keep building stars and keep um, their talent free flowing and making sure new faces make the scene and uh, people start to like them and they get over. Um, it's really, it's really exciting to see that happen. But 
Now I think we can get into AEW Rampage's debut, also taking place in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this was a hell of an opening, I think, for AEW Rampage. They kicked off out the gate with the Impact World title being defended between Christian Cage and Kenny Omega, the ty- the belt collector himself. This was a hell of a match. And I think this really got the crowd for the first time really behind Christian, like really behind him. And like these guys went back and forth in some great work. Christian was really good at like kind of trying to almost ground Christian. I mean, Chris, uh, Christian trying to ground Kenny Omega for a bit while Kenny was really trying to build up that high octane offense uh, really trying to work in to get that uh, one winged angel, but my God, dude, Christian did a hell of a job in this match, and not only that, he's now your new Impact World Champion. I actually tweeted out saying like he's once again Impact Champion. He was never Impact Champion, actually. He was an NWA Champion, but he was never Impact World Champion, actually. So I I swore he was because he was like so popular and impact he was so so much he was used so much in impact i swore he had been tna or impact champion before it wasn't the case but he is now and god it fits like if you needed something for uh like we were talking like floyd talked about earlier like would have been a great shot in the arm to impact who has been kind of teetering down a little bit since kenny omega hasn't been on on their show as much christian being the champion i think is definitely a sign of good things for impact a guy who i can imagine would be on the show a lot more than Kenny since Kenny's been like for the most part fully AEW I could see Christian kind of doing double duty on both shows especially appearing a lot more so to defend the title on Impact's home soil but this was a huge moment to start off I know it I mean it's Kenny's first loss in a very long time and Christian still remains undefeated and like we said like Leading into All Out, people weren't sure about um, Christian winning. To How is this going to build to the All Out match? How are people going to still want to see this match now that Christian's already won? On- honestly, it's like I'm still behind this match. And I think Christian showing how well he could compete against Kenny to win. And again, more so the fact that he won the fans over, I think. That shows that, like, okay, you've proven yourself. We want to see this match again. I think that's shown fully in this in this opening match but man christian came out and he freaking killed it honestly it's seeing him as impact champion it just feels so right it really does but jr your thoughts first on this opening match it was a good match it was um you know i'll be i'll be honest and floyd will tell you i told him i said i fully expect christian to become an impact champion and I think there'll be there'll be a way that it's going to end that will make it to where the match at All Out will make uh, you know make more sense than just a rematch. And what I mean by that is that obviously the way the match ended, Christian won, but there was you know some sh- a little bit of chicanery with the way that the finish was. You know there was a still chair involved, so Christian has the opportunity to say, "Hey, I beat you. I deserve." a AEW World Championship match at All Out, while Kenny Omega can say, hey, you may beat me, but you didn't beat me for and score one, two, three, and I'm going to be able to, uh, in the rematch, I'm going to beat you in the center of the ring. Um, and there won't, you know, essentially to get people more involved. So I like the way, especially the ending of it. And you mentioned earlier about, you know, it's Christian potentially playing double duty, and it was shortly announced after the win that next Friday on Impact Plus, August 20th, it will be Impact Plus Emergence. Christian Cage will de- defend the Impact uh, Heavyweight Championship against um, Brian Myers. Yeah, that's, right. that's going to be a big match. Um, this was the perfect way to start this uh, new series, new show. The big thing was, and every everyone knows this, is that everyone's like, this is the B show. And Tony Khan has been adamant that this is an A show. He's like, this is just an extension of Dynamite. You know, it's going to be on the same level, the same stakes. What a better way to do that? First night, three title matches. What better way to do that? First match, 
for a world title for another company changes hands. Uh, I have been really critical of Impact, as in I didn't understand. Uh, I didn't understand what Impact was doing. Kenny was their champion. I'm like, you got to have a guy that you're building to beat Kenny, who's going to be the next guy in your company. You have to have a guy. I've been on this for like months, and I just didn't feel like they were building anyone. And they didn't. <laughs> they had another AEW guy beat them on the AEW show. Christian actually, advantage to Christian, he's a much more beatable person. He's not as, well, technically he is protected in AEW right now because he's undefeated, but he's not as protected as Kenny Omega. You know what I mean? The only person that could beat the AEW guy for the Impact Champion was another AEW guy. So I just think there's, you know, something that goes along. It protects Kenny. A weapon had to be used to beat him. And it now it adds ex- excitement to Christian uh, against Kenny Omega. Can Christian beat him again for the big title, the belt that really matters to Kenny Omega, the belt that he turned his back on everything he believed in for, signing with uh, Don Callis and cheating to beat uh, Moxley. It's the stakes of this match gets higher. Now I wonder... Does the match at uh, or does the match at AEW or at uh, All Out become winner take all? What do y'all think? I don't think so, honestly. I think it's simply just because it's for the AEW World Title. I think it's just going to stay as is. Um, I think a winner take all could kind of like build it up of like it's, but like. I don't know. I, I truly think Christian continues to be Impact World Champion because, like, while, of course, they want somebody that's fully committed to Impact to be their champion, I think, uh, going forward. I don't know. Christian, I would think, would defend it more than Kenny did, honestly, or just appear more. I, I, maybe that's just me. Maybe that's just me. What do you think, JR? JR, are you there? I apologize, my uh, my mic went off. Oh, okay. Um, I think I don't think it'll be runner take all. In fact, I'll take a step further tomorrow as we're recording Friday the thirteenth and New Year's neck of the woods is probably already uh, Saturday the fourteenth. We have triple. Uh, I believe the way to say it is triple Maya. Kenny Omega will wrestle Andrade for the AAA title, and I am convinced that Andrade will defeat Kenny Omega for that title. And then Kenny, the belt collector, is going to be down to one belt, Kenny. Um, and it will not be a, you know, title for title match at All Out. Um, I think potentially Christian Cage would hold it and potentially do a job in Impact Wrestling. Uh, not against Heath, I believe somebody else. I um, don't know who yet. I'm not, I don't watch a lot of Impact Wrestling, but I do think Christian Cage will be more on that television. Um, and do more, uh, I think, because of his history. And the term you said, like, beatable champion, I think Christian Cage, um, when you see him potentially lose to someone in Impact, would go over, would be go over better, for lack of a better word, than Kenny Omega. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think so, too, honestly. I think, I really do think Christian... While, like, um, Kenny Omega, like, losing the other titles, some people might think it'll, like, damper him a bit. I just don't think so, because first off, Christian had to use a steel chair in a match to win against Kenny, so that protects him. And, of course, it was because Don Callis kind of messed things up. But also, um, I think, I don't know, I just, I think him losing those two titles won't hurt his AEW title reign at all, honestly. And I think it's just because, like, while ha- him having three titles is dope as hell, like, again, he can only defend them so many times because he's still committed to AEW. So I think it's fair to for him to go back to just being AEW world champion relatively soon. So I think I think that's fair to say. But we can move to the second match of the show, the TNT championship match between Miro and... And Fuego del Sol, if Fuego won, 
not only would be he be TNT champion, but he would also get a contract to be with AEW. So Floyd knows that Fuego is an Oklahoma boy. So Floyd, do you want to tell us about uh, this match simply? Yeah. Um, okay. So the match starts with the the face, the the fire. Fuego del Sol. He cuts an amazing promo in the video up. But yeah, the video package is great. Yeah. Yes, he cheats. <laughs> he attacks. He attacks our boy uh, Miro before the match hits his signature tornado DDT. Uh, Miro, uh, I think he rolls away. Then he hits it again. This time he rolls literally out of the ring, so he can't get the pin. Mira almost gets counted out. It gets the nine, jumps in the ring. Fuego then hits the top rope on, and then Miro kicks out. And that was pretty much the end of the match at that point. Miro, you, you're trying to embarrass me on national TV, and it got pissed off. And I think three moves later, big Samoan drop. Uh, the What is it, the kick? I forgot what they call the kick. And then the game over uh, with the full extension. Um, get the match. And, uh, I mean, quick... It was a perfect match because for 0.5 seconds, they had me believing they were, especially with what they did in the first match, I thought we were going to get the moment. They worked me. I was excited. I was standing up. I have to say, they worked me. And then Miro hit the small and drop, and I was like, oh, it's over. But for that 0.5 seconds, they had me in the palm of their hands. And so Miro wins. Then after the match, he... uh think he kicks him again he uh, puts him down and then tears up the contract because this match was for a contract then the moment happened and i again i i state this often i don't cry a lot when it came to wrestling but 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 i felt like i was running around because my eyes started sweating when i saw tony khan and sammy guerrero came out because I think the moment we saw Tony Gaon and Sammy Guerrero come out, I felt like we all knew what was going to happen. And then uh, they come to uh, Tony says, you go get him. Sammy goes down to the ring and basically says, sometimes when you lose, you still win. I love you. Everybody in the back loves you. You know, you're all, all elite. And you see the tears in Fuego's eyes as he cries. I mean, this was a real moment. He, you know, it was that moment. He saw it coming and he like literally broke down and started crying and he gets in and he just, kept, all he kept saying is let's go because like literally that's the only two words that can came out of his mouth. Uh, I was just saying before the show, uh, five years ago, six, maybe, I was at a show in Shawnee for a, a wrestling group called uh, Imperial uh, Imperial Wrestling Championship. It doesn't even go by that name anymore. Uh, Imperial Wrestling Revolution, IWR. And it, it doesn't even go by that name anymore, but they did a big show at Shawnee, and this little skinny, skinny, maybe 135, 140 pound little mass dude comes out. To low rider, all my friends love the low rider. That song, just in case anyone didn't know, I don't like to sing the George Lopez theme. George Lopez thing, and they came out, so that immediately popped me right. Like, and then he started wrestling, and I was like, "This dude got to gain some weight." But you saw the moves there, you saw the energy there. I went on to see him wrestle in probably. eight to ten times in different areas in Oklahoma City. I literally saw him wrestle outside at a local music festival. Like, just there. You know, like, you want to talk about paying your dues. Like, everybody at this music festival was there for the music. They didn't really know what they were watching, but at the time, you know, they started chanting, and it's just... He's from Oklahoma. I know he claims from Alabama. It's a shout out to his grandpa. He's maybe lived in Alabama at some point in his life, but for as long as I've known him, he's been an Oklahoma City boy working at Walmart, quit his job, flying down, 
literally driving to Jacksonville at uh, points. I think the first few weeks he drove the uh, 18 hours to Jacksonville. You know, nothing given to him. Just kept showing up, kept showing up. Uh, lesson in perseverance. I, I mean, I, I can, I'm honestly going to stop myself because I could probably go on another hour, and I know mm-hmm. people don't want to be here for another two hours. But for a person, like, he probably doesn't know me from Adam, but I've always rooted for him. You know what I mean? I've always been at the shows, and it's just like, congratulations, brother. Congratulations, man. Congratulations to Fuego. He 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 earned it. He deserved it. He he's all those different mantras I don't like to use because I don't think they apply to most people. They apply to Fuego. I saw the work. I saw his friends from Oklahoma City literally driving to Jacksonville, you know, for a payday that probably didn't even pay for gas. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, every week he was there doing the. Uh, he was traveling when no one was traveling. COVID. Once they he celebrated when they started giving him a plane ticket to the show. You know, paying for him to fly out there. Him getting a room because I think he was just staying in Sammy's room. I mean, you want to talk about it? Sammy's vlog doing the recording. He would literally do anything they asked him to. There you go. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Floyd put it really well. The match itself was a relatively short one because, of course, it had the three tornado DDTs. And then quickly, um, after the Samoan drop, the super kick, and then the game over, <clears throat> it was it was over. But, yeah, no. On, the fact that Sammy went out and made the announcement to him, honestly, Fuego's face, it said it all. Really, really feel good moment. Honestly, there's really not much I can add. Floyd really covered it all. Jr., you got anything you want to add to that at all? I enjoyed the. I enjoyed everything about it. I thought it was amazing. Uh, like match, it was a short match, but the way they put it together, um, especially adding that count out moment at the end, I was like, oh shit! If I was gonna pull this off and get a contract, I just loved everything about it. it I think it. And I think I said it last week is that they're giving him this Mikey Wolpeck type of babyface bill. Like he, they're gonna mess around. They're gonna have no choice but to put a bell on Fuego. Yeah, I mean seriously, it's it's it'll get to that point. I think possibly down the road. But yeah, Fuego, really good to see. Honestly, it was a really good feel good moment. We then had the main event: Britt Baker, Doctor Britt Baker, DMD, the AEW Women's Champion, defending her title against Red Velvet in Britsburg. Massive hometown response yet yet again, and great heel heat uh, just flying down at Red Velvet, who was there to play the heel for tonight only. Um, it like Floyd hit it right on the head. It's full on Bret Hart in Canada. Like it works so well. Just he's a baby face in Canada, but he's a heel in the U.S. She's a baby face in Pittsburgh. She's a heel everywhere else. Honestly, it makes sense. And this match. I think this fully makes up for the somewhat lackluster match that happened against Nyla Rose. Nothing against Nyla, nothing against Britt. Just it was a match that really didn't have a ton of build towards it, and the match itself was just kind of okay. This really established fully how well Britt Baker is doing with that AEW Women's Title, and it really cemented her run as being substantial and really important. These two did really great. Red Velvet really. Like I said, she slid into the role of heel very quickly, like under these circumstances, and played it well. There's a great moment where she knocked Britt Baker down and she just flashes like she sticks her tongue out and goes like ah, like stick and like mocking the crowd a little bit and then quickly tries to go for the pin. Love that little moment. Britt Baker had her arm uh, kind of rolled up in like a, in, I, I want to say a cast, but it didn't really look like a cast. But Red Velvet did a great job working on that arm and then Brett, Britt being the smart woman she is gets the lock job by hooking both arms and then taking her, her weaker arm and then locking it in the mouth of red velvet, still being able to with that added pressure of both arms being locked back and then still getting the pressure on the jaw was able to really lock that lock jaw in, in a creative way to retain the title. And after the match was over, uh, red velvet was then, uh, jumped by Chris, by Chris Statlander 
making it known that she would be going for the AEW Women's Championship. So there's another great movement from this point on. Red Velvet did a great job of playing the heel in this one match in Pittsburgh. And now I think uh, we we really get to see now babyface heel. Like Now it's going to be like fully Britt Baker being a heel against a very popular Chris Statlander who is a babyface. This will work really well. Like kind of like people who are like, well, she's a heel, but she gets cheered. I think this will really steer steer people back into like, okay, now she's a full on heel. But this was a great way to end off the show. Honestly, Rampage did a great job coming out the gate and really showcasing, like Floyd said, and like Tony Khan said, we're not treating this as a B show. This is going to be on the same level as Dynamite, just an extension of it. And yeah, this is great. It's more AEW. What what more could you could you ask for? Uh, Jr. Thoughts on this women's title match? The um, the one thing I'm going to say about this match is I love Burt Baker and everything she's done. I said earlier with her promo. The ending, though, I feel like they kind of ran out of time. It seemed like they were running out of time where they were trying to um, put a lot in a, sh- in a short amount of time. I mean, between the ending, the extracurricular activities that occurred, you had a, a debut or, or reemerging uh, return, and so it just seemed like it was kind of a lot. Um, you know, obviously it's a new, it's their new show. It's a one-hour format, which is different than they're used to, and so there's some kinks to be worked out. And the one thing I will say, just not a fan of the four-man booth. I feel like there's a lot yeah. going on that just, um, you know. I will say this, like, Jericho can be good, but he really was, like, screaming a lot. Uh, Mark Henry, I feel, because he has a deep voice, it's a little bit harder to hear him. And I, I do enjoy Excalibur, um, and I love Taz. I think Taz, by far, in my estimation, is the best commentator they have um, in AEW currently, with all of the respect to everybody. But, yeah, they really need to, like, not a fan of three man three man boost to begin with. Definitely not a fan of four man boost. Yeah, um, before we toss it to Floyd, yeah, I will add on that too because yeah, I'm a I'm a commentary guy, so that means a lot. Um, yeah, when I saw the four man booth, I kind of was got scared, and then during the first match, I saw exactly why I was scared because everyone kind of had to lead into who they were talking to with this booth to let people know, let them know like, okay, now you can talk. So they don't talk over each other on a live TV show like that Four commentators is just way too many. Like I, again, like, like Jr. I don't really love three man booths necessarily, but AEW has done well with the three man booth with, uh, with uh, JR, Excalibur, and Tony Schiavone. And whenever they include a, th- a fourth, it's normally just a wrestler or Don Callis and stuff like that. And I can deal with that to an extent. Um, but no, it was... And again, I think when when Mark Henry went backstage to interview uh, uh, Red Velvet and Britt Baker before the match and also do backstage interviews with Christian after he won the title, I don't think he came back to commentary, if I'm fully mistaken, if I'm fully honest. Because as f- far to my knowledge... When he went backstage to do his interview with Christian, he never came back from what I could tell because I didn't hear him again. I could be wrong and he was there, but that's the issue with four-man booths. You just don't get time to get your shit in if there's too many people talking. And if I was to – like, I love Jericho. I love all four of these men on this booth. If I had to take a knock at, like, who to take away from the booth, honestly, I would kind of chalk it up to Jericho. While Jericho's good on commentary, he tends to get screamy. He really does. And while he does do a decent job of like, it's weird because he's kind of, he kind of does like what he does on commentary where he's a bit heelish and he's kind of like that little, uh, not of like a heel baby face kind of like nod between, uh, commentating but then taz kind of does that too honestly i would just kind of remove jericho from commentary as much as i love him i just don't see it. like if you have to knock one out i would knock him out because he kind of hired mark henry for this purpose to begin with other than being a trainer so i would say jericho wouldn't fit but yeah also with jamie hater being debuting after this and beating up chris statlander i fully did not recognize her because when they said they re- she remade herself, she really did. Because when I looked up what she looked like back on Dynamite when she was on for the short period of time, full I was like, "That's her!" Like I, th- it was such a confusing point because it was such a drastic change in the way that she looked, and she hadn't been on Dynamite that long that fully people just didn't know who she was when she showed back up because we hadn't seen her in a really long time, and she. 
from where what she looked like with her hair to being fully blonde now, like you could not tell that she was the same person. Like I fully forgot that that was her. So, Austin. I, yeah, Austin. Be honest. You thought it was Becky Lynch. I did not think it was Becky Lynch. <laughs> the only small thing that thought was like Rhonda. I was like, no, it's not Rhonda. That was that was truly what went through my head because I was like, "There's no way that's Ronda Rousey because that would be ridiculous." She is but not a small a person. Comment. She is not small. Yeah, exactly. I saw a few people comment on Twitter, um, just going through like some of the mentions. They're like, "Come on!" A lot of people thought it was Becky, and I'm not gonna lie because it's, to me it looked like red hair. I was like, "Who is that?" And then I was like, "There's no way that could be Becky," especially because the commentators like they're hesitating and hesitating, and it just was somebody I was. Did not expect to see, and, and I'm not familiar with her work to be honest. That. Yeah, I never got Becky from that though. But yeah, because this chick seems like she's like five ten. She just seems so much bigger than Becky to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when I, didn't I look at height, I, no, I like her. I mean, I'm a hey, I'm a I'm a size dude. So the first thing I saw was that she was like a good four inches taller than Britt Baker, and I was like, good lord, this chick is big, <laughs> and uh, that's all. It's awesome to me because I love it. And she just came in there, and Chris Statlander and me. She, Chris Statlander, is only a few inches shorter than me, and she was over Chris Statlander. So, she's a tall chick, and yeah, and she kicked ass, and I love it. I love it. I like Brit. Uh, Brit has a heater. She has muscle. It'll only help her to be more heel. Now she has a tag team partner in matches where Rebel doesn't have to wrestle, and she can just be Rebel. I thought the match was really well done. Uh, the visual of all the towels turning, you know, like towards the end of the match with everybody spinning the towels, I thought that was a great visual that if you're going to do something for Britt Baker's uh, package, uh, video packages later, you definitely have to have that visual moment in there. And Britt stayed a heel. She didn't do anything face. She stayed a heel. And I love that about her. She's so good. Uh, I thought Red Velvet stepped up every time they put her in a big moment. She steps up. And I think she stepped up in this match. Told a great story. She's just not as good on Brit's level right now. And that's, I mean, the world champion's the best wrestler in the company. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. And that was AEW Rampage, the debut of AEW Rampage. And we'll quickly wrap up by doing our pre- Austin trying to cut out there. Uh, can you hear me, Jr.? Yes. Okay. I thought it was me that cut out. No, it's me and you are here. Austin's not. But we are going to do a preview. Hello. Yes, we're going to do a preview of next week's Dynamite. Take it, Austin. I'm back. I don't know what happened because I could still hear you guys. So apologies for the technical difficulties on that part. Um, but yeah, we can now do our preview for AEW Dynamite. Then we'll send you guys home from this episode of All Things Elite. The matches that have been announced so far are the Young Bucks versus Jurassic Express for the AEW Tag Team titles, Chris Jericho versus MJF in the final labor of Jericho, where Jericho cannot use the Judas effect, and there's no Judas music for the entrance. And then Darby Allen teaming up with Sting to face off against 2.0 in a Texas Tornado Tag match. And those are the matches that have been announced so far. Yeah, I'm very excited for Texas. Also, uh, that I didn't put it on here, so this is on me. Uh, the guy Dan Lambert from America Top Team is going to be making oh, an yeah, appearance, that is true, yeah. uh, appearance next week. So apparently, there's going to be some guys from the USC making an appearance on AEW next week. Begin to speculate, but uh, thing I'm most excited about, and I mean everything on here is good. But Sting and 2.0 is just so freaking entertaining as a team. Again, when you think about the idea of them just being able to do anything and make it interested, you wonder why someone else couldn't use them. But, yeah, I, that's the match I'm excited about. Uh, it's in Houston. Again, I'm going to be very depressed next week because, you know, in it's so close to me. It's generally in driving distance, but sometimes – as JR has starting to teach me slowly, is that I have to tell my nail self no sometimes. Yes, sometimes. Yeah. No, no, that's like the biggest thing JR is teaching me is that I have to say no because, good Lord, 
I always say yes to myself. I can't turn myself how down. Those, how have those teachings gone, Jr.? How have those gone? Man, when you become when you're a married man, and you look at priorities, and there's so much that you want to do. You have to begin prioritizing like your list. And for me, like I'm, 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 I'm like Floyd. I, let's be real. We're all massive, giant ass kids with with big incomes, you know. And so, for me, my priority is traveling. So that's what I do. Like I come back on buying a lot of you know collectibles, so I can focus on traveling. Then he tempts me by sending me Sting's new jacket that's coming out. Yeah. And I was like, I got four jackets. I haven't wore like any of them <laughs> other than to take the picture to put up on Twitter. I I am done with jackets for a while. All right. <laughs> we'll see how he sticks to that. You know, God, the Sting jacket looks so cool. Sting jacket, is, does, the Sting is, jacket does look cool. It's actually I a jacket have- I would wear. <laughs> The other I haven't bought just... any AEW jackets. The only AEW jacket that I have is a Penta El Cerro Romero one. Oh, I, oh, I'm sorry, in the FTR one. So, like, so my... you have bought AEW jackets. I apologize. <laughs> I thought I did it. I can't have a lot more in that closet. That that is, I have some uh, older jackets uh, that are wrestling, but uh, I would, like I didn't want to, like. There's no point in buying jackets. You know, I live in hot weather. Like, I only get like three months of like if it's cool cool weather that would wear a jacket and have so many shoes from but i saw it i'm like i like sting i love sting that's a badass design i would love to go but i I probably would pass and that's the thing is it gets you because you're like i do i really need it but but then at the same time you're like you want it and you have to make a choice when they're like a limited quantity or you can only order in a week so if you don't order next week you'll never get it that's it it's over and done with so so on the twentieth, when we're in, uh, when, uh, we're in Chicago, Austin, it's going to be eighty-two with isolated thunderstorms. So it seems like jacket weather. So I think you got to bring your CM Punk jacket. Oh, you know I am. Yeah, like that for that show specifically, I have to. I will be in my Fuego del Sol jacket. Way to go! He got I'll wear some. my uh, I'll wear my AEW Chicago shirt just so I have something AEW related. Uh, no, I know. my Los An- <laughs> I wear my Los Angeles Dodger jackets in Chicago in two weeks. No, no, it's so funny. It's gonna be so funny because if you've seen Fuego jacket, and oh, oh it's, it looks like a piece of shit. It's a terrible jacket. So I'm gonna be walking in the airport with this jacket. <laughs> And if he Dude, the of, looks you're gonna get, the yeah. looks you're gonna get. <laughs> like what? The, what are you doing? Why do you have that on? I mean, my Chicago jacket, my my CM Punk jacket is loud. It is loud. Yes, yeah, so I. But it's cool. It's, it's cool as fuck. Though. Yeah, it's a cool jacket, but mine it looks like a yeah. chi- it looks like a child drew <laughs> jacket. So like, hey, oh my kid drew me this. My kid drew me this. Yes, yeah, so yeah, so it's it's very fun. But I am really looking forward to Dynamite and Rampage next week. And honestly, with Rampage, it's gonna kind of change the format of this show because I'm probably yeah, gonna have to. Dance. Yeah, uh, it's probably gonna have to like. I might probably have to record audio, like you know, because there's so many. It's they, AEW when we started to sh- didn't have a show. Now they have four weekly television shows. Well, two YouTube shows and two national TV shows, and then they'll have roads to the top. And then you got to watch Being the Elite. Then you have to watch Sammy's blog to get you know the added detail of each show, and it's just like. AEW's trying to take over your life. They really a bit, are. A little bit. A little bit. I mean, they've already taken over my pocket. <laughs> but yeah. they, they take over my life. But uh, to show you the, the JR's influence, there was a SmackDown in Tulsa tonight. I did not go. Uh, AEW, and I think it was in Waco or Austin. I didn't go. Uh, and then there's going to be AEW in Houston next week. Did not go. That's the influence. There you go. <laughs> well, I think that'll wrap it up for this episode of All Things Elite. JR, my bud, thank you again once again for coming on this show. It's always a pleasure to have you on. Be sure to check out the Trick or Treaters podcast uh, as soon as you can on this formerly Friday the 13th. Uh, listen to some horror podcasting uh, fun from JR. Uh, where can people find you once again on social media, JR? Uh, always appreciate talking to you guys, especially after yesterday. Um, today's rampage and talking to you guys definitely lifted my spirits up. So you can find me once again at, at Trick or Treat Pod. That is at Trick or Treat Pod, uh, home of Trick or Treat's podcast. Uh, you also find our link, our link tree on there where you can access our merchandise as well. 
and uh, you know help out uh, small uh, small time content creators and everybody have a wonderful weekend. Absolutely. And once again, guys, be sure to continue to download this fine show on Google or Apple Podcasts. You listen to us on Spotify or any other podcasting platforms to share with your friends, family, coworkers goes a long way for us. It truly, truly does. Leave a rating and review. Leave a donation through Red Circle. That would be incredibly generous. We are at AT Elite Pod on Twitter. At Social Suplex are the guys that make this show possible. They are our podcasting network friends. Be sure to check out all their other shows on their network. I am at Austin Sumowitz. Floyd is at Floyd Johnson Jr. on Twitter. And Floyd, go ahead and take us home for this episode of All Things Honest, Honestly, everything I usually say at the end of the show has been said. Get vaccinated. Support all wrestling. Whether you're at home, work, or school, always do your best to be elite. Meyer brand lunches keep kids fueled for back to school. Start with a wholesome sandwich made with our honey roasted deli sliced turkey breast and provolone slices on Meyer's split top wheat bread. Add a side of fruit with Meyer applesauce squeezable pouches. Treat them at school, after school, or anytime with assorted fruit flavored snacks. And pack it all up fresh and neat with Meyer brand sandwich bags and napkins. Discover big taste and bigger savings when you go back to school with Meyer brand.